What's up, you filthy casuals? Welcome to the Casual Shenanigans Gaming Podcast, a podcast all about everything. Dang it, I've messed it up. I did it right <laughs> one week. So our tagline has changed uh, in the past couple weeks from a podcast all about everything PC gaming related to our new focus, which is just the irreverent love of gaming. And uh, I 100% messed that up, and I'm sorry, but the, the muscle memory <laughs> dies hard. It's the, it's the inner PC player in you, Jeremiah. You, can, you can't keep him down. <laughs> He's fighting to be heard. <laughs> or I'm so used to just, like, cruise controlling this podcast that I, I actually have to pay attention <laughs> if I want to do it right, one or the other. Uh, but I am your host, Jeremiah, and tonight I am joined by Dave. Hey, guys. I am joined by James. What's up? I'm joined by Joel with Singularity 80 sitting creepily behind him. <laughs> Wave, Steven. <laughs> no, he can't hear us, Kenny. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And, uh, and we are joined by reoccurring guest to the show, Tristan Moore. Welcome back, Tristan. Hi, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Um, thanks for coming on the show. Not that you're not like super busy or anything. Right. I know you just sit around waiting for, for opportunities like this, but yeah, thanks for coming on. <laughs> um, you guys might remember we had Tristan on last year in March, I believe. Uh, he was promoting a Kickstarter for his game Grave that Joel stumbled across when he was looking through Kickstarter stuff. And uh, we're going to be catching up with Tristan in just a couple minutes and talking to him about indie games. That's our topic for the night. Cool. This podcast is going to be all about the wonderful wide world of indie gaming. Because when there's like major things like E3, you get a lot of AAA game news, and we've been kind of drenched in that for a couple weeks. Um, but we don't focus on indie games as much as we'd like to, so we thought we'd at, at least have one podcast completely dedicated to them. Uh, but before we do that, we have some announcements. Next Saturday, July 25th, we are having a Grand Theft Auto Online community game night. If you are a member of the Seal Slappers on the Rockstar Social Club, uh, the Seal Slappers, of course, is our name because we couldn't get any of the ones that made sense. Um, But you should come out. Debbie is putting together a special playlist. Uh, We've played some of those missions already, and they are nuts, if nothing else. But there will be bounty hunts, and there'll be special races and death matches and stuff. Um, As always, you can find the link to the Seal Slappers in the description of any podcast video or the audio. Uh, And there is a link to our TeamSpeak server. So it's going to be at 8 p.m. next Saturday, July 25th. Um, hop into TeamSpeak early. We'll be in there a little bit hanging out, and uh, it's going to be a really awesome time. And for those of you who can't make it, I imagine one of us will be streaming it. We'll probably stream it to the Casual Shenanigans Twitch channel, which we haven't actually done a whole lot with yet, but it, it'd be a good thing to stream. So uh, if you Indeed. have any questions, leave us a comment or write into casual shenanigans at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to answer it. And we look forward to seeing you guys next Saturday. Uh, also, a little bit of housekeeping. We want to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon. Uh, That has allowed us to grow the podcast and do lots of cool stuff we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. It's paid for nice things like mic upgrades, lighting upgrades, um, hosting our website, hosting the podcast, and paying for the potato masher, which is currently recording. It is not recording the podcast because I completely forgot to hit the record button. (laughs) It's recording the podcast now. (laughs) There you go, guys. Jeremiah putting your hard-earned money to good work. (laughs) <laughs> um, or Darian not. Jones in chat asking, yes, it will be PC only. I don't, there's no cross play, uh, compatibility for consoles and PC for GTA five, which is good because we'd be, <clears throat> the PC players would be waiting for 10 minutes while the console players tried to load, uh, missions, <laughs> <laughs> but at least it wouldn't crash. That's true. So <laughs> there'd be less micro stuttering on the PS4 version, uh, but we'd be waiting. We'd be able to do like a race in between the console players joining the next yeah, race. So everyone, I'm starting a uh, GTA on PS4 next month. So go ahead and start launching in now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But anyway, we want to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon. Uh, and this week we have someone who has updated their pledge. Joel, are Ooh. you? <laughs> what? <I don't> know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this brings Joel pleasure. <laughs> so anyway, Joel, who are we thanking this week? Well, folks, we're thanking Daniel. He updated his pledge. I wonder how much. I'm very curious now. <laughs> <laughs> Was it a cent? Was it a quarter? Was it two dollars? He's not Ben. He's not doing yeah. it just to mess with you. Um, he also sent us a nice message, but I'll read it to you guys after the podcast because it's a little more like inside baseball. Um, <laughs> it's secrets that can't be read on the air, but that's our, our Patreon thank yous. Um, and just give a quick cross promotional thing for Casual Shenanigans Tech. 
The first episode <laughs> released a couple weeks ago. If you don't know what it is, it's Dave and I answering your computer build questions, your tech support questions when they relate to PCs, and then talking about the, the latest hardware. Uh, going more in depth than we're able to on this podcast without Joel and James completely tuning out. They have not tuned out and texted each other in like three weeks, which makes me pretty proud as a okay. host. <laughs> you want some of the other funny? hosts? You want to hear something funny? Sure. I was, I was listening to the tech podcast. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and you tuned out and started like texting somebody. <laughs> I did. I, I like. I got two. I tuned out like ten minutes in, and I went to like text James. I'm like, oh wait, this is not live, and I'm like, I'm, I can just pause. I can just pause it. I don't have to escape. <laughs> well, never changed, thanks, Joel. Joel. Never changed. <laughs> but we recorded the second episode. Uh, was it last night, Dave? <laughs> yeah. So Joel, will, he'll be he'll be sleeping like really well next week when he has the podcast to listen to. Like every night, just like a baby asleep. <laughs> I'm so glad we can do that for you, Joel. I'm, yeah. I'm just glad we yeah. can provide that for you. Well, Jeremiah's anyway. voice is so oh, calming; man. it just actually puts me to sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, it is now time for the main topic. Which is Tristan. Hey, Tristan. Hi, how's it going, guys? <laughs> so, thank you for sitting there patiently while we were idiots. Um, when we had you on last year, yes. you were promoting Grave, which was successfully kickstarted. Yes, it was. Um, it was, and actually, your Kickstarter was one of the more exciting ones to watch because, like, it was relatively unknown when you started doing it, and like for a while, it didn't look like it might get kickstarted. Like, yeah, it definitely absolutely. picked up steam close to the end. How was like? How is it promoting a game that's trying to be kickstarted? Does that take up a huge chunk of your time, I imagine? Um, yeah, so um, they always say that you're supposed to, like, plan to make it your full-time job during the Kickstarter. Um, but I didn't realize <laughs> that it was also going to kill me during that time. So I kind of <laughs> had thought, okay, so I'll get some stuff prepared in advance, and as long as I know what I'm doing, I'll kind of, like, have an outreach plan, and I'll talk to people, and you know, we'll do what we can. Um, but it turns out that actually, um, even doing that, I was horribly unprepared. Um, normally they, a Kickstarter does this thing where it's kind of like an inverse bell curve where like you get almost all of the pledges at the beginning, like the largest chunk, then it ebbs off for the middle and then you get a lot, but not quite as many as at the beginning at the very end. And so you can usually tell within the first week, like, if it's going to work or not. And according to that, there's no way that Grave should have been kickstarted at all. But um, <laughs> basically what happened was we, um, we were just pushing to try to find the right angles on getting uh, coverage. And we ended up doing, like, this weird thing where we petitioned Markiplier to uh, play <laughs> the game on YouTube. And... Um, well, that was basically like a lot of uh, Kickstarters will ask people to up their pledges at the end to try to help them get there. And I figure that that's kind of like not fair because those people have already pledged. They've already right. done what they're they're entitled to uh, to get return out of. And um, so we just said, like, if you want to help this succeed, just like tell Markiplier to play it. And we like kind of <laughs> sent them his way. And like on I think it was Thursday before closing out on Sunday, he played it, and then, like, everyone on YouTube practically played it. Like, uh... Nice! <laughs> Cootie Pie played it, I know Manga Minx played it, the two best friends played it, um, I'm probably gonna forget names, but there's just tons of people. Not that I want to, like, promote your competitors in any way or something, but... Oh, psh, um, <laughs> Yeah, our people like PewDiePie are, are neck and neck competitors there, yeah. Direct competition. <laughs> yeah. They got just one more million than us. Okay, yeah, no, I mean, it, I'm sure it's pretty close, like, you guys, I'm sure, yeah. at like, what, 38, 39 million? Yeah, yeah so, something okay. like that, yeah. So, if rounding one way or the other. Um, per it, week. It's close to that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so you got, like, a lot of, it looked like you got a lot of press kind of right there at the yeah. end. And then we're able to get it funded, which is awesome. Yeah. Like, it's, it was really, like, um, it was really interesting because um, the, the game would never have been possible for us to just do on our own, like, um, and, and I can talk a little bit more about how that like kind of segues into the, the stuff with reflections as well. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so I mean, basically, um, we asked for thirty seven thousand, which was like uh, what we needed to get things rolling. And as the game has been developing, we sent out a backer build, and we've been get, keeping everybody up to date. And what we realized is that like we had more ambition with the game than we were originally intending. So um, the game is taking a little more time um, right now. We're trying to target closer to the end of the of this year, but um, I'll keep everybody updated about that. Um, but we wanted to, to kind of supplement what we were doing by going to our shelf of ideas and finding another thing that we could work on that could like we could polish up and get out 
for some revenue. And I had worked on a prototype in 2012 for Reflections. Um, and so we were like, oh, let's, let's uh, polish that up and get it out the door. And of course, that was like, me with my bad planning, it took a little bit more effort than I thought. But um, <laughs> but yeah, so um, I, I was like thinking, oh, you know, we made this game. Let's just like give it a couple of weeks and we'll like polish it up. And then I was like, that didn't quite happen that way. But um, so <laughs> yeah, I was, what, I was wondering, like it, you, being a, a small developer yeah. working on a just kickstarted game, you have to be like, I'm drowning. Oh, look, I found more bricks. <laughs> like, let's right. make a second game. <laughs> How, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So it, it's been it's been interesting, right? Because like. Um, we, uh, we spent a bunch of time working on our, our backer demo, and then it ended up being what like we'd call kind of a vertical slice of the game, which was more representative right. of the final experience. Um, and when we were doing the original Kickstarter, the game was definitely very shallow in its kind of goals. And um, we always had intended to build it out, um, but we realized like it just was going to take a little more time. And it seems weird that we would try to like grab a, another project to help us with that, but... Um, uh -huh. our, our goal was to basically start developing some revenue for the company so that we could get um, the game fleshed out to, this, to the spec that our fans deserve rather than just mm -hmm. delivering kind of like a, uh, like a milk toast version of Grave that people would, could like forget about in a week. So. Right. Well, that's, so you were talking about like your, your role in the Kickstarter. Sure. I think what a lot of people don't realize about indie game developers is like you're not only one of the main developers, but you also, during this time, you're the P are you the only PR guy? Are you the main PR guy? Um, so my wife helps me with PR sometimes, but I'm the one who's like been so embedded at it. So like at this point, I have like a one-year correspondence course in being a PR guy that has <laughs> that's kind of hard to beat. <laughs> um, so most of the stuff that we do outreach wise is just me and like most of the time when i uh mess up outreach it's because i just forgot or right. <laughs> or something like that <laughs> or i did it wrong or i like forgot to upload a video or something um but yeah it's um it's been really weird because that's not something that i ever considered part of my core skill set like at all so um but i usually have this idea of just like go big or go home so i just refuse to fail at things and uh <laughs> and that's like to me the kickstarter was kind of an example of that of like it, it really was failing for a little while, and I was like, this is not going to stand, and I, I did what I <laughs> needed to do, and uh, for the most part, it worked out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, so, did you, like, how did you get started being a game developer? Like, did you always want to develop indie games, or did you, did you want to work, I know part of the answer to this, but sure. I'm asking for the benefit of the listeners. Right. <laughs> um, did, did you always want to be an indie game developer, or did it just work out that way, or like, was it the right decision at the right time in your life, or how, how did you end up doing this? So, I mean, th that's kind of a complicated question. I mean, like, I was working at a, at a larger studio uh, before mm -hmm. the Grave Kickstarter, and I ended up actually, like, calling my boss one time and being like, I need to go because I have to do my own thing. And it was like, he was great that he was like really accommodating because like he's still a good friend and we still like meet up and I do some help for his studio when I can. But um, what really happened was it was a desire not necessarily to be indie, but to be able to control my destiny to some degree. Um, uh -huh. For sure, yeah. I think that as we, as we go with the studio and we grow it out, like I don't know how um, like traditional indie will be forever if, if things do well. Like, because we want to make bigger and uh, bigger and better games as we go, and right. um, and I think that like, but the indie mentality to me, like what really defines indie, is the desire to build something that is completely our own, and right. and that's what like really, um, it was almost like a, a switch got flipped um, last year where I was like, you know, I, I went into the game industry originally because I wanted to, like, I had that, like, childhood dream of being the guy that makes games that I liked, right? Uh, <laughs> like, like, like all of us, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and so, like, and I ended up getting, I worked at THQ for a little while, and that, that was, like, kind of miserable. And then um, I went and I got a design position at Redacted, which is a studio that just is uh, currently working on Afro Samurai 2. Um, mm -hmm. And... I worked there for a while, and I uh, in in less than a year, I went from like junior designer to like lead designer, and that mm -hmm. was good. Um, but I had this kind of like pull to do this other thing that was kind of like my own vision for what I could do with a company, and and ultimately I just was an idiot and didn't know that I shouldn't try to do that, and it actually worked. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, the, like the desire to, to do something yourself, do you think it's the, the games, at least the ones you've been working on, yeah. do you think it's experiences you wouldn't have gotten the chance to do if you're working for a larger company because of the type of game they are, or just because that's not the type of game that typically gets turned into a massive blockbuster. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's interesting when you work at larger companies where you start realizing that there's like so many cooks in the kitchen. Like there's mm-hmm. <laughs> there's like a cook and a saucier and then a saucier assistant and then the saucier's <laughs> accountant and they all have like <laughs> the opinion on what the the steak that the guy in the other room is making should be. <laughs> and like, um, and so... I, I don't know if it's necessarily impossible to make games like the stuff that we want to make in a larger framework, but I think that what we try to do is experiment. Like, we're trying to do things that are outside of the norm. Like, um, Grave is a little bit fringe, and then I think in a lot of ways, Reflections is, like, super fringe. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can say, like, hey, we're going to make a game, like in Reflections' case, where only one-fifth of the game is ever possible to see at once, and that you have to actually play through multiple times to see different levels and it's like that's something that's just not economically viable for most large studios because they think about it as this sort of like well what percentage of people are going to see this content and it's like we're guaranteeing yeah. that you can only see that if you've played it yeah. in a replay then like why are we not just putting it in a ling- linear string so that the reviews will say long game high marks you know like and <laughs> <laughs> So I think in that way, um, being indie gives us the ability to like fail flexibly, flexibly, but also mm-hmm. take risks. Um, right. I, yeah, I don't know if that is a, a good enough answer for that, but yeah. No, it is because I think that's the biggest thing, and we're going to be talking about in just a minute here, like the the indie games that all mean a lot to us as as you know the different hosts here and you. And uh, to me, the biggest thing that stands out for indie games is not really the size of the game necessarily, because there's plenty sure. of AAA games that are only a few hours long. Like that's not like the length or the scope or anything that doesn't really separate indies to me. What separates indies is it's a more unique experience that you wouldn't normally get because it's not like as conventionally marketable. You can't make a couple big posters and a few action figures and a 20 second TV spot to accurately explain what the game is. It's an experience that you really have to have for yourself. And it's, it's harder to sell that in the big flashy press conference way but yeah. it sells really well when you get people to actually play the game and talk to their friends and leave great reviews on Steam and you know it goes on Steam sales and stuff like that. To me, that's what makes an indie stand out is it's the game that all your friends tell you you ought to be playing and you don't hear about from as many other places first. Like It's not the thing that everyone you know is buying. It's the thing that people have been telling you for th- three months. you got to check this thing out. This is unlike anything you've ever played. This is so interesting. That's why you need to look at this. And I think it's interesting that you were doing um, – grave and grave is like one of the few survival horror games that's actually really creeped me out before oh cool um yeah. so I, I i don't really get creeped out by things in general not like because i'm so hardcore or anything but like i just whatever it's because he's bigger than most things yeah 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 Joel, but <laughs> like the, the stuff that is used to creep people out for whatever reason like it doesn't work i don't get it like it doesn't I still can't it believe doesn't work that, for me that alien isolation didn't work for you that is not such a great all. game Man. not even a little bit and and wow. pt uh the pt thing on ps4 nothing did nothing for me uh but grave <laughs> legitimately creeped me out that's cool um and I, most of the really good survival horror I've played has been indie games. Like the only mainline one I've played in the last couple of years that's a AAA game was The Evil Within. And like, mm. it was way too much of an action game. It was way too much like TV commercial, giant blockbuster feeling. It was and Resident it Evil 4, right? I mean, basically, Shinji Mikami. It basically is Resident Evil 4, which has not aged as well as you think it has. I have very <laughs> fond memories of Resident Evil 4 until I, uh, until I played The Evil Within. I was like, yeah, this is kind of clunky. Well, I think the biggest problem with that is that like Resident Evil 4 became like a template for all games. Like after it came out, like... <laughs> Almost every game that was mainstream was borrowing from Resident Evil 4 in some way afterward, whether it was the style of how you mantle objects or, like, how you put your camera in a third-person game or how you set up your enemy structures and all those kind of things. And it's like, so when Mikami went back to Resident Evil 4, it was like, hey, how about that thing that you've been playing every day for the last 10 years? Like, why don't we do that? And I think (laughs) it was a little bit, like, too little too late, I think. Um, yeah, I, like I, I, if it had come out like instead of Resident Evil Five, I probably would have played it and loved it. Right. But I think like I, I've just moved on more <laughs> since then, where I don't 
that type of game doesn't appeal to me as much anymore, but that kind of bums me out because I've always been telling myself, I'll go back and play Resident Evil 4 one of these days. Like, I'll dive into it. I'll have an awesome time again. And now, like, I'm just not 100% sure if I want to because, like, it's it maybe works better as a memory, you know? Like, I, I have very fond memories of that game, and maybe it's more perfect to leave it as that you know, um, and, and if, not if, try to make it happen again. I, I think nostalgia goggles are still in play with Resident Evil 4 for me because I still can play it and really enjoy it. But if you want to mm. do it in an interesting way, what you should do is you should play a no-merchant run on professional. Um, because uh, So that's something that I do for fun because I do, like, knife-only runs in Resident Evil games and things. Um, and, <laughs> and so, like, uh, I... I I'm sure I'm not the only person to do this, but basically if you go through the entirety of Resident Evil 4, it's fully completable without ever buying anything from the merchant. Um, which wow. means no inventory upgrades, no weapon upgrades. You literally get the default shotgun, the default pistol, you get a broken butterfly, and you get a rocket launcher that you can use once. And then the rest is just like strategic use of grenades. Um, and basically you have to run from like 90% of fights if you do it that way. So like, if you want yeah. to go back and check it out, do something like that, it'd be kind of fun. That, I, I mean, be fun. I probably wouldn't make it past the opening level. Like, I'm not that skilled when it comes to super, like, inventory management and stuff. I'm more of the let's just blast a hole straight through it type of person. Um, right. I don't know if I would do that well, but that sounds like something Joel would be really good at. Did someone say inventory management? You have my attention. <laughs> Shut up, Dave. Uh, no. Uh, well, how could you play through without hearing, what are you buying? I actually just shot what him every time. Selling? I shot him every time. It was great. <laughs> Wait, you can, kill, you can kill that guy? Yeah, you can shoot him. Like, he doesn't come back in that region, but then he'll show up at the next huh. one, and he'll be like, oh, hey, you know, what, you shot me I in did, the face, huh? I guess that's a way to remove temptation. <laughs> like, you kill him, and you can't be tempted to, like, come back and buy yeah. something. You can stab him with a knife, and you can find a weird bug where they didn't add any particle effects for stabbing the merchant. So, like, <laughs> you just stab, nothing happens, and he falls over. <laughs> uh, someone, Beza, uh, Bezatrix in chat had a question for you, Tristan, oh, if sure. you don't mind. He said, uh, he doesn't know anything about how real people get jobs, he says. Uh, <laughs> okay. When you get, when you get hired at, at a game design studio, is it often higher by contract? Or is it normal to be hired as a regular salaried employee? So, uh, the places I've worked, it's always kind of been this weird thing where you are a salaried employee that you're, they are calling a contract. Um, which basically just means that if you do anything wrong and they want to get rid of you, they can do it immediately and not have to worry about it. Um, mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily have to give you benefits at first. Um, huh. And so like that, that was kind of how it was at THQ. That was how it worked at uh, redacted. And it's like, I, I don't mean to say that like there's anything wrong about that business practice. It's just basically, it's like there's so much turnover in the game industry that it's like very, difficult to invest long term in people so they usually invest in people who have like large career reputations like they mm -hmm. they bring people on who have worked in the industry in the fields that they're hiring for and they really want to acquire that talent most entry positions are something more like a contract and that's why there's there's a lot of turnover in the games industry yeah unfortunately or is it, do you think it's fortunate or unfortunate? Like you get the opportunity to work on lots of different things, but you don't have a lot in the way of job security. Like that's a, that, I mean, that's sort of difficult to say whether it's fortunate or unfortunate. I mean, like the, the film industry is pretty much the same way. And the reason <laughs> the film industry works that way is because like, it's a product driven business. Right. Um, and so like, I don't know that necessarily keeping people jumping from job to job is good for like long-term productivity or value. I think that a lot of the studios that can really carve out their niche and stay there are the ones that do the best. But, mm -hmm. um, but I also kind of understand it because like if you're making dead space eight or whatever, and you need tons of people to come on just to work for a short window of time, you don't even really need your full production staff for the right. final six months of development or something. And right. And so, like, it's just kind of, unfortunately, the the outcome based on the type of industry it is. Cool. Well, uh, Tristan, we asked you to prepare a list of two to three indie games. Oh, your camera just went out. Oh, I, I'm going to hopefully address that. Okay. Oh, and now it's I coming had, back. <coughs> that was weird. I had a couple questions for him oh, before okay, we... Oh, okay, sure. Um, yeah. Was there any... I was watching your, your videos. Um, they look... The, both games look really amazing. Oh, thank you. By the way, like... I love the whole just, just ex kind of explore, do whatever you want. Right. I mean, that's you know that makes games like Gone Home and stuff like that really good. Is that you're kind of like getting into your the world, and um, 
I'm really excited to see where Reflections oh, goes in that regard. But um, the Grave got my attention because of the music. Are you at all oh, yeah. a Fallout fan? Um, yeah, actually, not as much as you might think, um, because a lot of people have made references to Fallout more than I think were actually intended. Um, for me, I'm a big like old school Silent Hill fan, but um, but nice. yeah, Fallout is something I really like. Um, I think that I have probably accidentally imbued some influence from Fallout because it's definitely a good game, but it wasn't I mean, necessarily that, my that, intention. That, that sold me on your game, so I mean, oh, yeah. wrong with that's that. good. That's good. <laughs> I was like, okay. I'm liking where this is going. <laughs> You're talking about the more recent trailer where we had uh, Down by the Willow Garden by Herta Marshall? I don't know the name of the song. It was okay. very old. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, actually, it was cool because we actually licensed that from the Smithsonian, which I totally don't know that we oh, could wow. afford. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, so here's what's funny. Uh, the video almost got took, taken down for an uh, automated copyright strike. Oh, um, classic YouTube. <laughs> and we had paid them specifically to use it and then it said this song belongs to uh the smithsonian <laughs> folkways collection i'm like we know that's why we have an invoice <laughs> and i <laughs> send it to you but yeah so no no that was, um i think that like for me music is one of those like unsung heroes of gaming where it's mm -hmm. like um quentin tarantino was the guy who like for me really made music like popular music and cultural music part of films um, mm -hmm. Like where, as opposed to movies where they just like have a score that they compose for it, um, and I think that like I would like that to be an element of what we do in our games is like using music that feels like cultural music or representative of the times kind of music rather than just being like oh look there's an orchestral score. And so I, I'm glad that you like that part. Oh, the other thing um, you were talking about cooks in the kitchen. I think that's sure. you know with the bigger studios, I think having cooks in the kitchen means that you are having to take very very calculated risk like sure. you you only have like certain parameters i'm imagining that we can push it this far this you know this far but you can't really push any boundaries but you know with indie games you know you're taking a risk with like doing a melancholy feel or doing something like that but in your mind i imagine you know it's going to work, but you have no one to tell you it's not going to work. So then when you actually get to yeah. see it work, it's like, told you, told you. <laughs> yeah, no, and actually, it's funny. Um, so the biggest thing that I notice is the, the problem that I've seen with the too many cooks thing is not necessarily, well, it's two things. One of them is uh, it's, it's herd mentality. It's like, ultimately, nobody's good ideas come out unless like seven out of ten people all agree with it. <laughs> um, and a lot of times those are the ideas that you already know are kind of lukewarm because everybody can all get a, get behind it already. Yeah. Um, and then, but then the other thing is like when you have somebody who is in like the top chef who like doesn't know anything about video games or something. Um, and like, I, I, I won't say any specific details, but there was a time where I was working on like a kart racing game and mm -hmm. they were telling me, all right, we need this game to play exactly like Mario Kart. <laughs> but with all of the physics of Forza. <laughs> Wait, so play nothing like Mario Kart. Right, though. and I was trying to explain how you can't say that one thing is a thing that is not that thing, and then, like, you know, it becomes this whole, like, esoteric, like, Schrodinger's game design where it's like, it can't be both things, or maybe it can, <laughs> but... Throw in police chases, too. <laughs> what if Star Fox was a chessboard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, it was funny. Um, one thing, uh, one time I had somebody who actually gave me a compliment on, on that project where they were like, this, this idea of pressing a button to drift is this really novel mechanic, and I think that's a cool idea. I just don't know if it will work. And I was like, what? <laughs> 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 We implemented a basic feature of Mario Kart. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, but Forza doesn't have a press to drift button. Oh, wait, no, that's the handbrake. Yeah. yeah I guess that's, <laughs> that's true. Technically, every car has a press to drift button, but it has a probability of success. Kids, don't try that in real life. I had a friend who thought he was being funny, and he yanked his buddy's handbrake like driving down the road at highway speed because he thought it was just going to lock the wheels and be funny. And it did lock the wheels and they rolled the car over. So, whoa. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Stick to well, Mario that, Kart. That turned dark. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and <laughs> podcast momentum. Crap. It's a yeah. prank, bro. It's a prank. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the thing I love about indie games is that the, the risk that you can take. I mean, of course, it's, it's I mean, any game is a risk because it, right. it can fail, but you know, when, when you have developers that are actually pouring their heart into games, you know, the, the type yeah. of games that they put out are generally, you can feel it when you're playing it. 
Um, yeah, I totally know, and they agree also with they that. can recreate experiences that you know other games can't. Like you know, you see a lot of two D games now as indie games, and which you know, for me, growing up in the the eighties and nineties, you know, two D games are great, but they're not they're not exactly like I guess financially viable. Right. But when an indie developer does it, it's an amazing experience and a great throwback too. Yeah, totally. I, I think it, like with like two D games, it's kind of funny because we had the whole like graphics arms race that kind of happened mm-hmm. when the PlayStation One came out, where it like suddenly became really unattractive to make a two D game, and it's like that's how markets tend to move. But um, but there's always the people who go back and they play their NES games, and I really feel like the uh, the initial burst in two thousand eight of all the indies was like based around that kind of realization that something could be done on a smaller scope now that didn't used to be. Yeah. Um, and now let's talk about Tristan. Yeah. T- two to three indie games that mean that are significant or important to you, and w- and we're all going to answer this. And uh, why is why are they games that you don't think would have been made by a large studio? Like, what? Why were they especially suited to be developed by a smaller team? Yeah, I mean, so um, I had I had three that I thought were good choices, and um, two of them are a little bit similar. But uh, one of them is Braid. Um, mm-hmm. Then my other two were uh, Dear Esther and The Stanley Parable. Okay. Um, and so, like, the, the thing I think was really interesting about all three of those games is that, well, first of all, they were heavily um, auteur designed in one way or another. They w- were based on a very strong vision from a small number or, in a lot of cases, just one individual. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, Braid, I think, was like, I mean, it's pretty seminal at this point because it's so important to the indie community. General, right. but I think that Jonathan Blow is like a really remarkable thinker, and he's been hugely influential in my developing my design aesthetic because I've listened to everything that he's ever said, and mm-hmm. um, I really love his approach to games as kind of a cohesive whole. Um, I think that his games have too much design direction to be made by a committee of people, mm-hmm. um, and I they're, think they're too focused. Yeah, like, they're too specific. Like, mm-hmm. they're not catering to the Call of Duty crowd. And, you know, like, they're not trying to throw in elements of things like Mario just because, oh, people like coins or something like that, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that, like, Jonathan Blow... Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that, I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that, you know? Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, I mean, I think that he was really the first one to say that, like, you know, you can take a game design and make it better by not doing the same things that other people do while still borrowing from the, the succession line of games that have led up to this point. And, mm-hmm. um, so and then uh, Dear Esther for me is like this really interesting experience of what happens when something can't be done with a movie and it can't be done uh, entirely without being in a physical space. And um, to me, Dear Esther is almost like urban exploration or cave diving the game. Um, and I think that that was a really unique experience just because um, it's proving that there's a certain amount of interactivity that would not be... It's almost like Half-Life 2 minus, right? Like, um, if you just look at what Dear Esther is, it's like they took how Half-Life 2 worked, and this is kind of literally what they did, too. But um, And then they just removed the combat elements and the puzzle elements and the, like, Ravenholm elements and, like, just had this exploratory run. Um... And, and I think that in a lot of ways, uh, Stanley Parable is the same kind of thing, where it's like, mm-hmm. um, and it, it Stanley Parable has some of the problems that like Reflections would have trying to pitch it to um, to a publisher is like really a game that's fairly short in one playthrough, but there's like tons of different possible variations of that story that can happen just by playing over and over and over again, and mm-hmm. and I think that like it takes all types of games to a degree to like really make a vivid gaming ecosystem and I think that for me those games all do things that are like daring in their own ways that um, people wouldn't necessarily trust until it had been done mm-hmm. okay. Stanley Parable had some great writing in it too yeah, like, yeah it was the, just the, the whole, fun <clears throat> yeah the uh, the whole like Masters of the Universe co- I'm sorry not <laughs> Masters of the Universe uh, um, what is the name of that movie there's like oh shoot well anyway um, <laughs> great British <laughs> narration <laughs> um yeah no um hitchhiker's well, guide to the galaxy yes that was hitchhiker's it. guide to the galaxy yeah. okay yeah <clears throat> um joel what are your indie games that are important and special to you oh uh, 
I hold these very close to my to my chest. What the hell? Um, right. <laughs> I, I love. <laughs> Here they are. Uh, I, I really love Dear Esther. That was definitely one of one of my favorite one of my favorite games. Honestly, I, I love stuff like that. It felt like being in a movie in a way, just like being like a kid walking around on an island alone, <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a horrible disaster. Experience. Did you do that as a kid? <laughs> <laughs> Reminds me my of being a kid when my parents would just drop me off at a tropical island and go by Joel. They just yeah. go off on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love we'll that. Um, absolutely love Journey. That game kind of blew my mind. It was that game was very much a an emotional experience actually for me. Like playing the game, it was really touching. Um, and. Yes, they used the controls really well. <laughs> they did a Can lot I change of my answer control. to that? <laughs> I want to change my answer to that. <laughs> uh, yes, especially the ending of uh, of Journey. That was that was really really unique and something I've not I've finished ever, yet. So I, I won't say anything. But it and was one of those games. Where I, was, I was sitting there watching playing the game, and my wife was watching. We were like, "That was an extremely unique experience. Like that was awesome." I I, I was just kind of blown away for several hours after I. Like, I'm excited to play it again on the PS4 when it comes out. So, um, and then last is Limbo. That that game was awesome. I loved every second of that game. Sp- the first spider, like there's a little part where you get past the spider, and then there's a little twist there. And I was just like, "What? You yeah, what?" And it just like freaked me out. And I just loved it. And the, the ending was just like, "What the <laughs> crap?" So yeah, it, I love the atmosphere. I like atmospheric games. Um, I've got two games. My first one is FTL. Uh, I love sci-fi stuff, so FTL instantly jumped out to me for that, and then I also love the music, so even on like the main menu screen, I already knew I was probably going to like this game. Um, but for me, FTL is cool because it's so hard, but it gives you enough of a lifeline that you feel like you will do better next time. You will, you might do better next time, but like half a percent <laughs> better. Uh, you only get better by dying hundreds and hundreds of times in that game before like it took me... 45 50 hours before i was at the point where i felt like i could reliably beat it almost every playthrough um and which is like very rare that i would stick with any game that long much less a game that i hadn't actually been able to beat like there's so many failed tries doing it Uh, ftl to me is is one of the weirdest indie games i've ever played and the fact that it's so difficult and normally i don't stick with games that are super difficult because i like rewarding experiences um (laughs) and I, i normally just don't stay to suffer uh, but I really did like it was totally worth it for that game, and I like that suffering. Yeah, that's right, Joel. <laughs> um, and it was so awesome. And then in the same vein, my second pick is Spin Tires. Spin Tires is a game that could only exist as an indie game. Like a lot of games don't have a lot of story, and they're a sandbox. Spin Tires has literally zero story. There's no story. They just say, "Hey, you're a logger." Go pick up the logs and bring them back. Like, that's literally it. Here's a couple different trucks. You can find a few more. You can, you know, you can unlock a few things. That's it. There's four maps. Go drive in the mud. I feel like it's just like like you are a Russian trucker that doesn't believe in insurance. Like, go do what you want. <laughs> That's but like, it's, backstory. It's such a simple setup. Not that the game was simple. Like, a, a ton of work went into the game. But the setup is so simple. They just dump you in and you just figure it out. Like, they don't tell yeah, you. They yeah. don't give you a hand-holding tutorial where it's like, this is the type of mud you'll sink in. This you can drive on. Don't ford the rivers. They just go, here's a truck. You can't see any of the map. The logs are generally over there. Go figure it out. And like you'll spend three hours dragging this giant load of logs through a stream, cursing everything you know, like every name you've ever heard, desperately trying to get the logs back. Just the feeling of dropping a couple logs off in a clearing is like the most rewarding thing ever in that game. We've, we've had Jeez. one section. Jeez. Yeah. I know. I, I just, heard what I, I said. I finally got it. I heard what I said. <laughs> dropping the logs. I was just laughing just at, the oh, feeling of hilarious. dropping a couple logs. <laughs> No one go camping with Jeremiah. <laughs> I, I stand by my statement, but um, uh. I mean, there's one where me, Dave, and Chris were trying to get some logs through, and we're in a river. And like, who was, I don't know who was the big truck. I think I might have had like the large truck. And Dave is like pulling me at the front, and Chris is ramming into me from the back. Joel, try to keep yourself contained. And they're like, it's like this. That this, sounds a little wrong. It is. Yeah, that's why Joel's losing it. Is because he can't be an adult for five straight well, minutes. Let's not forget though, Jeremiah. In that that first go of it, dump a log, dump a log <laughs> in the forest. Where, where you're exactly? Like, yeah, it's not my fault. 
where's yours at? Where's your? Am I like we've got to create a winch train? And then Chris was like, it's everyone's dream. <laughs> yeah, we were winch trained our way through a uh, a stream and over some mud. Like when it works, it's really really awesome. And there's plenty of nights where I play it where the trucks just flip over and sink in the mud and everything doesn't work and we give up. I really would like them to add a save functionality to that game. That would that would make that game a little more like I'd play it more if I could save in the middle of it. But um, yeah, it, it's a really awesome game. And definitely you would never get that experience from a major game just because you can't like, how do you market that game? You'd never be able to pitch that to an investor. Like, what's this game about? You pick up logs, I'm dropping logs in the forest. It's like, right. Well, what's the, the story? <laughs> what's the story? Nope. Just the law, just the logs. You got to get them from over here in the woods to over there in the woods. You sell DLC. Yeah, I, they probably could. They actually, they've got a very vibrant mod. We cut out fifty percent of the game before we ship it. <laughs> um, I really That's always important, to, right? Yeah, yeah. You, we got to make sure you get that, you know, day one DLC ready to go. But they get too much value the, out of your sixty dollar product. Exactly. That's one thing I love about indie games. They tend to be a lot more. Hey, here is the game. Mm-hmm. Like, not here is the first chunk of the game. Not here is the main story part without most of the outfits. It's like no. Here is the entire game. Here you go. Enjoy. And it's way cheaper. Speaking of Hitman. <laughs> um, James, it is now your turn. What uh, what indie games mean a lot to you? Um, I really enjoyed Gone Home. Mm-hmm. I, I tend to like games that, um, like if I sit and just play and play and play through, like if I, if I finish it in one to two sittings, mm-hmm. I consider that a really good experience. I wasn't so crazy about the ending, but I liked I liked the feeling of actually walking around this house and like looking through stuff. Like it was, it was looting and it was looting, but it didn't have any like benefit to looting other than finding (laughs) clues and stuff. Um, It's a narrative justification for why you're looting. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, if they turn the story off and I just kept looting, I mean, I'd probably still play. Uh, (laughs) So yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm looking forward to uh, reflections. I just, Cool. Start putting the stuff in the cupboards. <laughs> <laughs> it's really anyway, weird watching James Dave, get you know. excited about stuff like this. Like you just pick stuff up and you can move it around and put it on a shelf. And I'm like, yeah. So, and James is just like, it's a spiritual experience for him. <laughs> you basically own it in real life, Jeremiah. <laughs> yeah, you, that's for James. That's what it is. Game. Like he's owning it inside himself. He owns th- that whatever he's touching for a little bit of time. <laughs> Okay. I know I'm not really great with the words tonight. I don't really know what's happening. But uh, anyway, James, what's your what's your s- second game moving along? Uh, so I tried to list just games that I've actually completed. Um, like I loved Limbo, and I loved um, what I did play of like I didn't completely finish Stanley Parable, but that that was fun from what I did play. Um, but Steam World Dig was just kind of a it was one of those freebies on. PS4 and it was just something that I just sat down like oh this is kind of addicting mm-hmm. and then like six hours later like I like just sat and played and played and played um, it was amazing and, that, and you know that's definitely something that <clears throat> that kind of game is just something that a big studio couldn't why, why couldn't they why wouldn't they do it I mean it was just a it was just a little 2D digging game mm-hmm and so you, I mean, you get to upgrade your characters and stuff like that and you get, you know, different skill points and stuff, but it, it's just, and, and James, the amount it's of, kinda, it's, hard, it's hard to, um, advertise too. I mean, I mean, yeah. think about how to, how do you advertise that? I mean, like, is that kind of footage going to just blow people's minds on a TV commercial? You know well, what I mean? What I was going to say, Joel, is that we, they need to have James advertise it because the, like the pure glee in his voice <laughs> explaining it to, to me and you, Joel, like he was just so guys, excited about it. I'm James, <laughs> and I really love this game. Like I love looting. It's just like the camera slowly zooms in his face. It's just glowing. <laughs> Single tear <laughs> looting. And well, it, it, I mean, it is. It's, it's a game where you loot, you, you get different gold and gems and stuff. But then the other... It, it's not the trifecta, but the second leg is the uh, the upgrading, leveling. Now, if it had dialogue trees, I would be done. I probably would never <laughs> leave it. <laughs> <clears throat> and then my my last one is again another throwback to like the two D uh, cave story. I really enjoyed that. Um, just like a little teeny pixel guy, and it, it just it, it felt like a good old school game, but it was you know really good quality. <clears throat> and then my kind of my. I haven't finished it yet, but Axiom Verge was kind of a. What uh, is Axiom Verge? I keep hearing like the a, name, but I don't know anything. It's about like it. a throwback to the old Metroid games. Really? Like it literally feels like the old Metroid games. Huh. So, if you get a chance to check it out, I definitely recommend it. Yeah. 
All right, Dave, uh, I see you took two to three games to heart and, and put down more than that. But uh, what do you got for us? Really, Dave? Really? You I didn't actually, put that on there? I actually swapped out one. I'm starting out with The Witcher 1 because I read an article just yesterday about uh, their start as a studio. Um, CD Projekt Red was originally a developer that just ported games. They were trying to lower piracy in Poland. They got a hold of this IP that was huge in Poland, but like unknown elsewhere. I had this quote right here from the article that just sums it up. 2005, 2007, we were really young, really inexperienced, even outright naive, and that we thought we could accomplish anything. What's more, we actually believed we had the know-how to do it. In hindsight, I honestly have to say that we were wrong. <laughs> so he's being really hard on himself there, but to see the studio that, um, I mean, honestly, the, the first Witcher is definitely an indie game. It has that rough, like, no offense to Dark Souls, but like a Dark Souls one, like like uniqueness, but also like kind of roughness to it. Um, but to, to have this entire trilogy spawn out of it, and you can't say that they're a indie studio anymore. I don't think. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, they definitely, definitely have, not. They're probably going to have like the game of the year this year. Well, I guess yeah. it's a big year. Fallout it's Four a, and it's a tough year. Yeah, and Battlefront. It, it, it's it's a tough year. It, they it's have a contender a for game of the year, like Fallout. Or sorry, Witcher Three will definitely be up there. That's huge to do that in only three games. <laughs> I mean, that's that's pretty amazing. And, and this is actually one of the first what I consider indie games that I ever uh, got a hold of, and, and it was thanks to Steam. I got The Witcher One for like five dollars on a Christmas sale in two thousand ten. Uh, would have never played it if it wasn't that cheap, and also it was on the uh, what is it, the Neverwind Nights engine, so I was able to actually play it on my laptop at the time. Um, but that's just a really neat story uh, to have an entire series grow out of a out of an indie indie game like that. And for me, it got me into the books and all too. Uh, second for me would be uh, City Skylines, and this is kind of like the the indie game like victory flag waiver here. They did what EA couldn't in like every possible good way with the mod support, the community interaction, the scope of the game, the post launch support, the marketing. Like City Skylines is, is like. What everyone was hoping that SimCity uh, uh, was going to be. And now, do they still do they count as an indie studio though, or just a slightly smaller major studio? Because that's there. Like there's still only 13 people working on the game. Really? Oh, I thought it was more than that. No, they're actually they're playing like a expansion pack for sometime next year. Um, but they're playing like a like a continuation of the mod support and stuff like that alongside of it. But it's still just. 13 people published by Paradox. Yeah, that's that's amazing. They pulled that off with 13 people then. Yeah. And, and Wait, once is again, that 13 people in their entire studio or just that section of their studio? Uh, I Paradox that, has quite a few games now. Uh, Paradox is the, is the publisher, yeah. Their development studio uh, is only 13 people. And it's just gotcha. like this is their first, I think, launched game was City Skylines. So that's so an interesting that's, question, though. Is it is it still indie if you have a publisher? Hmm. I mean, how, well, how do you define indie? You're a real indie developer. How do you define <laughs> that? <laughs> uh, for, for me, I mean... I guess uh, it's weird, right? Because like Epic Games is independent, like they're not owned by anyone, but then they also like get publishers for their games and they're also pretty triple A. Mm. Um, like for me, I think it it's kind of hard to like quibble about which things are indie and which things aren't, because I think that a lot of like more togetherness is a better thing rather than trying to be like elitist about it. Right. Um, so like I, I think that a lot of times when when somebody has a publisher, it doesn't feel indie to people, though. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you guys feel the same way at all. Um, I, I don't know that that's necessarily how I feel, but I think a lot of people have said that to me before. So I don't know if that's a distinction a lot of people make. It's, yeah. it's tough because indie, indie, indie games have really ex just exploded in growth over the yeah. last few years. Mm -hmm. Like maybe when Epic Games was just Epic Games and they didn't have, you know, 500 other studios out there, mm -hmm. maybe they would right. be considered indie, but... I mean, even even City Skylines aiming for their their Steam release, they were projecting like a few hundred thousand lifetime sales. That was going to be plenty for their thirteen man studio. I mean, they sold like what was it? Uh, it was a million in two weeks, I think. Mm -hmm. it, it was insane. I, I think most of them for, were from watching your review. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best thing ever. You can create your own buildings to create on your own terrains to create your own cities on top of. It's just a big mixing bowl of creativity. It's beautiful. <laughs> Speaking of beautiful, Dave, what is your third choice? Uh, the Vanishing of Ethan Carter, both for Gosh, its... what a giant surprise. Dave picks that game. The, the game that uh, more people should have been talking about last year, but weren't. Yeah, I'll agree with you there. Um, for, 
for a game with absolutely stunning visuals, once again, developed by a small team from Poland. Uh, keep it up, Poland. We appreciate you. Um, <laughs> and then I, I really enjoyed the story. There was a lot of controversy, like, maybe not a lot, but some controversy over the ending. Uh, but I, I enjoyed the journey and the ending. And, and uh, even only getting about eight hours of gameplay out of the game, I don't think I'll ever replay it, but I really appreciated the experience. It was one of my highlights. Considering last it's year. a three-hour game, you got eight hours of it. Yeah, I was gonna say eight hours uh, seems a little steep to me, but sure, whatever. Um, I think the average was the average. How much, was how much did you stop and look at the pe- the textures? A lot. <laughs> I, I, I would definitely say the story was the weakest part of that game for me. That doesn't mean it was bad, but the rest of the game was so amazing for me. The story was just a way to move from one section to the other. For me, the real part of that game was just wandering around looking at everything, how beautiful everything was, like how every part of the game had such detail in the art design. You know, it, they don't just throw text up on screen, like it flowed and floated and danced through the screen. Yeah. Uh, and like all the particle effects off things you're supposed to look at, like it had a, a level to detail that games with budgets of, you know, tens of millions of dollars don't have on some things. Uh, and, and then, of course, it was gorgeous. It's one of the best looking games I've ever played. Uh, but for me, the story, you know, it was there. But like, I, I didn't really the whole supernatural murder mystery thing for me is like a little played out. Um, but the like the world was so amazing that I, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> and uh, Dave, what's your last one? Uh, that's actually okay. it for me. I, I was going to call it at three. I don't want to okay. have four games. I I, had, I picked a very careful <laughs> three by All the right. end. Well, I'm going right. to throw I mean, one, on, one more in here then for you. Okay. Um, I don't play that much, but my son just loves Minecraft. Considering like how big that's become for being just a, it's definitely like, not an indie game anymore. It would not. It's not. But it Microsoft owns it. I think it's past the line. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, that was, that was the first. But the game doesn't change titles. from being an indie game if you you know if a ton of people own it now and develop right. it now. You know? it, it definitely was an indie game. Yeah. 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 For sure. That's the uh, Cinderella story. <laughs> it's, the, it's the indie story <laughs> cinderella story oh hey welcome back tristan hey. hey yeah um did it was it able to recover your recording so it looks like it did awesome uh, all right joel just throw up a time code and throw up the time thing and we'll we'll break here until you're ready okay uh if you need to save pause do whatever just go ahead <coughs> we're totally fine sure sure um yeah no i'm sorry about that i know that no was, it's uh, all right it's not, it's not your fault um, it's Microsoft's so, fault. <laughs> so I'm hoping that there won't be any like corruption issues because um, like Audacity had uh, said that it had recovered the project and okay. it's like loading and stuff. So I'll, I'll just use a different sound recording <laughs> device for now and then I'll like hope that everything is okay. Okay, um, and so you can just, just send me like two separate chunks. Don't try like sure. don't bother trying to stitch it together or anything. I'll do all that. That's, that's without, no big deal. With Audacity, I mean you can you can open up an, uh, just a completely new project. Like it just, sure, yeah. You don't have to if you don't want to. Yeah, it makes launch sense. something else. Okay. All right. Cool. We'll yeah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> we'll keep going then. Uh, are, I mean, are you good for us to keep going? Do you need us to? Um, no, 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 I should be fine. Like I, I apologize that happened. It was no, just it's like okay. A, a it's no big deal. Um, all right. And then the last thing we wanted to talk about on indie games tonight is top upcoming indie games we want to look out for. Like we've talked about a lot of indie games we like, but if you listen to this podcast and you don't play a lot of indie games. One, next Steam sale when it comes around, or not before the sale, like you pay more money now, support the developers. But like if you want to grab all of these games to try out, if you waited till a Steam sale or something, you could probably scoop everything up we've talked about for like 30 or 40 bucks and you would get, I mean, way more, like the dollar-wise gamers would say, it's a very dollar-wise purchase. You'll get way more than 40 <laughs> hours of game time out of that. Um, if I, Out of all the games we've talked about, if I was going to recommend something for anybody to try out. If you love Dark Souls, try out FTL. If you like cars, try Spin Tires. And if you like really interesting, unique little stories, Gone Home, Stanley Parable, um, Dear Esther, are, and Vanishing of Ethan Carter are definitely stuff you should check out. Um, but upcoming indie games, who made this list? I did. Okay. <clears throat> Why do you think No Man's Sky qualifies as an indie game? Are they not an indie studio? I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Um, for me, it kind of blurs the lines. Like, not that we should be quibbling about what's real indie. Like, are your indie <laughs> cards intact? You know, you're too successful. You don't belong to us anymore. Hipster um, indie. <laughs> right. But, like, they were on the stage at E3. Like, their their game was. Like, it's it's a game that is a, definitely a household name at this point. But is they're, the studio still small? Sony too. Yeah. But oh, is yeah, the studio but small? I mean, they, are, they, consider, one, they consider themselves an indie studio. Okay. And... They don't have a lot under their belt. 
either. That's true. So, that's okay. I mean, I mean that's, well, that's and uh, <laughs> Unfinished Swan was an indie game, and that was backed by Sony. Journey true. was an indie game. Uh, that that's game true. company is backed by Sony. I mean, I don't think that makes something not an indie game. So that's true. That makes sense. Um, all right, so James, so <laughs> No Man's Sky, uh, yep. and then. What's everybody's gone to the rapture? What's that for anyone who doesn't know? <sighs> everybody's gone to the rapture is just and Tristan, your mic went. Oh, your, your video's back. Never mind. It's literally exploring an empty world. Like I, I don't know much about the actual story, mm-hmm. but it looks gorgeous. Um, it, let me pull it up. It's by the the Dear Esther guys as well. It's uh, by the Chinese room. Okay. Oh, nice. Oh, I've forgotten that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So it's open. It's open world, yeah, yeah, I can, but it's story driven. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's apocalypse, but it's not like desolate apocalypse. It's just empty apocalypse. It's like a light apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's our dream come true, James. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I an apocalypse. You guys can you guys can run around and loot, but like there's not quite as much disease and bandits and stuff. It's more like <laughs> it's, no an apo- it's an apocalypse for um you know us us unsurvivalist. <laughs> white boy Americans. Uh, <laughs> oh, you know, you just wander out outside and you don't have electricity and internet anymore. Ah! Um, all right. And then you have rhyme. What's rhyme? Rhyme. Uh, they showed that at the, uh, I think it was, was it the Sony press conference? The name sounds familiar, but I don't remember. It, it was, there's a, um, I think I showed it in 2014 originally. Um, it was a kind of a, it almost looked like journey style. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Rhyme look, uh, kind of reminds me of Ico. Or yeah, that, and, and that was like that, but a little bit maybe bigger, like, maybe or something. Yeah, it's like a yeah. It looks, it looks beautiful. It's, it's, I'm very excited for that game. Pretty cool looking exploration game, kind of in that like like you said in that art style of Echo, or you know Journey. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Mighty Number no. Nine. Mighty Number no. Nine is from the guy that uh, one of the original people that worked on Mega Man. Mm-hmm. And if you know Mega Man, has not had sequels for some reason. <laughs> I mean, in a while. I mean, yeah. well, they've had some bad sequels in like the the GameCube era, mm-hmm. and so this is pretty much the spiritual successor to it. Okay, in every way. Yeah, that's uh, um, <clears throat> Mega Man's one of those games I've never really played. Like, I missed the Mega Man era a little bit. Like when I got, by the time I got game consoles, there hasn't really, there's been like a Mega Man collection or two, but there hasn't been like a new Mega Man game that everyone was excited about that I've been able to jump on board with. It was the Dark Souls of its time. <laughs> I, I've heard it's very hard. I've never heard it compared to like. I that. beat one Mega Man game, <laughs> and then I retired. <laughs> <laughs> retired <done>. champion. <laughs> hey, that's how I feel about From Software's games. Um, and then <laughs> Firewatch. Firewatch. We saw that during the Sony press conference. Yep. You, you're a, you're a person in the what the American Midwest or the West who watches for fires, but it's like a mystery. There's there's some sort of thriller mystery vibe. It's to a mystery it. comedy. I, I've watched about ten minutes of gameplay, and the dialogue and the writing is fantastic. It's witty and it's really intriguing. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, that, that that's definitely a game I want to play too. And that that looked really good. That's the first thing I got confused when I heard it was an indie game because it's it's an indie game. I, I like that we're starting to get to the point where you don't have to look at indie games and go, oh well. You know the graphics aren't very good. Like, like, like yeah, whatever. But you know, it must be an indie game. But like, there's plenty of indie games where, like, no, like, the only thing making them indie is it's a smaller group of people doing it without as much money and without as much support. Like, it looks l- just as good as anything else they showed off there. Like, it 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 perfectly matched in. You know, I don't know how long the game's going to be, but it didn't feel like. And, and w- no, would you say Tristan is the Unity engine? to thank for a lot of stuff like that. I don't know if Firewatch is using that, but I know it you is, use the yeah. Unity engine for Grave and Unity engine is like the darling of developers right now, it feels like, so, or smaller developers. Yeah, I think that like um, with Unreal Engine, um, there was this sort of belief that like Unreal was really democratizing game development because it's like, it looks so good, you know? And like, but at the same time, I think while that was being said, Unity has been sneaking in and just been easier to use. And it's like, a lot of times there's a, um, a belief that if you can get something looking really good really fast, that that mm-hmm. must mean that that's the best engine to use. But then you actually have to make a game with that <laughs> engine that can also ship and be flexible, and you can make easy <laughs> updates to, and you can like test gameplay code and like experiment with. And Unity really like runs circles around even the newest Unreal in that regard. And I think that... Um, once people get an idea of how to use Unity, then they can do some really cool stuff with it. Like I know a lot of people didn't expect Grave to have been made in Unity because uh, because it's 
decently good looking, you know. <laughs> I, think, I think it looks gorgeous, honestly. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It doesn't look like a quote unquote indie game. Like it, it well, looks like it. It could be a quote unquote regular game that came out like sometime <laughs> in the past couple of years. Like it, it, the lines are definitely blurring. Speaking of Unity, I couldn't believe I didn't even know until two weeks after I bought the game that City Skylines is built on Unity. Like that's a it flexible totally engine. Yeah, it's it's really impressive. After so, all, we- actually, oh sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead. I was gonna say so like um I think that there's a lot of kind of weirdness in when when people think about game engines sometimes because like um unity is like a graphics rendering system and not a ton of other stuff i mean it's a really simple to use tool set and it uses like c sharp for programming and all that kind of stuff but like unity is just like a framework that ends up being whatever game you make and so far in all the experience that i've had with it um it doesn't really require you to go in any specific branches. Like, you can make games like Minecraft in Unity, you can make games like Call of Duty in Unity, you can make City Skylines, you can make Slender the Arrival, you could uh, make Dear Esther, you know, you can do any of those things. Oh, yeah, there's really no rhyme or reason, like, like yeah, when you totally. see the type of games, it's like, you see the little 2D platformer, then you see, like, something really, like, graphically intense. Right, and a lot of times why people think that, like, so when people say things like Unreal is, uh, is like a shooter engine, uh, what mm-hmm. they really mean is that the Unreal license comes with starter packages of their previous Unreal games. Um, and so a lot, of, um, a lot of times when you play uh, even a AAA game where you think, like, oh, wow, you know, they really did a good job of emulating Gears of War, it's like that's because they have all the code for Gears of War. <laughs> Like it, it's <laughs> oh, it is Gears of War. <laughs> yeah, it's bordering on a mod made by a AAA company, and it's like, mm-hmm. um, and now that games are getting genuinely easier to make, um, you see things like Unity pop up where you just don't have, you don't have any specific requirements that make it have to be one thing or another, and I think that's super awesome. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the the other two games you have on the list are Cuphead and Salt and Sanctuary. What's Salt and Sanctuary? Salt, I didn't put Salt and Sanctuary. Who put that on there? there? I did. Uh, what is Salt and Sanctuary? I've never uh, heard of that. I, I'm not actually sure when it comes out. I think it might be later this year. But it I saw it at an um, on a channel that's Dark Souls related. It's it's like a 2D Dark Souls. Like there's actually bonfires and stuff like that. It's got like kind of hardcore combat and stuff. But it looks really interesting. And because of that, it was the guy who was talking about it. You know, is obviously a huge Dark Souls fan. But it looked really, really fun. Just the combat looked kind of reminded me of um, I don't know, almost like Street Fighter, but like with swords and stuff. Like I don't know, it, it had like it wasn't a super three D two D game, like side scroller game. It was more of like the Super NES games. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it looked really awesome. But just like you know, you have to make it from one bonfire to the next and stuff. So it's definitely like a love letter to that game. So cool. I don't know too much about. It. I've seen a little bit of clips of it, but it looks really fun. Cool. And Cuphead, of course, looks just gorgeous. I mean, even for big, it looks that, that's, that's, the, that's the Popeye, yeah, looking it's game, right? Like old Mickey Mouse I, looking. That's doing it a disservice to describe it that way. But yeah, it looks like Steamboat Willie as a game. Um, and I remember it's we saw so that during smooth. the show. We were oh. all sitting there going, "Like, what is this?" And this looks really cool. Like, <laughs> Why do I feel connected to it? It's I have no so idea good. what it is, but I want to play it as soon as it comes out. Like, I don't, I don't know anything about it. Um, but now. It's time for the news. News time! Uh, so as we the, normally do... Uh, I filled in for you last week, Joel. <laughs> yeah, James did a really good job, Joel. If you haven't listened to, to James do the news time thing, he, he did awesome. Uh, uh, I, need, I, don't, I need to listen to it. I oh, you didn't already it. listen to the podcast. Thanks, you did. Well, I, the thing is, I did, but I, somehow I missed that part. I don't know. <laughs> the thing oh. is, I did. I just didn't listen to most of it. Because um, the news is like not very far into the show. Anyway, uh, so, Joel, what's your news item for this week? Uh... Oh, um, uh, Steven actually, uh, he actually, uh, we were just talking about it earlier. Um, I've been so crazy today. So many things I've had to do. Wait, how did Steven get up to date on, on game news while he was driving 12 hours to your house? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> like literally a minute before we, we got oh, here. I, I okay. heard, about, I heard about this earlier. Apparently it's just a rumor. It was picked up on. Kotoku, no, no, I've, so, I've read it too. So, yeah. I've read it too. But Batman apparently won't be patched until September. And I guess and out again to, to buy. And I'm like, holy <laughs> crap. I mean, and how, how big does a patch have to be before it's considered like, like prosthetic surgery? <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to like patch up a wound. I mean, I feel like they're having to like go in and like redo a lot of stuff. Yeah. I don't, I, <laughs> I don't even uh, patch. That, that's, this whole thing is just, it's, uh, it really just makes me angry. 
Well, here's, I guess, one of my biggest complaints about that, or just about, you know, how games are coming out now. Like, I, I was I was playing a game on PS4 the other night, and I looked over and, and I saw Joy. She was playing on her, our, her 2DS. She was playing a little RPG game on there. And I, I looked and I was like, that is a fully online game, never been patched, never updated. It works just fine. And I'm thinking, what the F? Like, <laughs> what what is with all these games, like, just delay it a freaking couple weeks or a month or whatever. Just do it. Because here, here's the problem, right? I, I mean, like, I know you guys you guys wait a lot for sales on games and stuff, right? But for me, like, it, it is a huge, it is a time commitment for me. So if I'm interested in playing some game, I, I look down the scope and go, not just, oh, I want to play it when it's on sale. But when it's on sale, I might really want to be playing another game. So I'm probably never going to get around to playing it. But for the people that bought batman on pc or and it doesn't work or, or whatever and they have to wait till it gets patched guess what's coming out this christmas fallout and a whole bunch of like just cause three and all these awesome games Witcher three dlc yeah. the side yeah, that's gonna really two. stink for them i mean but other I'm just, than- yeah like i mean that's 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 actually like well crap i might not be able to get around to the game until a long time or maybe not because i mean that i mean that's how i play games it's like it's not just oh it's a great game i guess i'll get around to it sometime but it's like it's hard for me to kind of keep up with some games I want to play. So if I don't play it within that three to five months as it's out, I might never play it. And you still haven't bought it for the console? No, I haven't. Oh, and, and that's, and, and I got lucky. It, it does. It does work well on my computer. So I got lucky on it. it you know, it's, mm-hmm. it works okay. Yeah. It, it, and that is disappointing past the fact that they, they said they were putting out a completed game that was not anywhere close to completed. That's the really disappointing thing. But it's just disappointing for all the people who wanted to play it who are hearing about how amazing it is, and now they can't even buy it if they want to check it out. Like The reputation of that game is going to be permanently tarnished, not to the fault of all the people who developed the game. It's mostly the fault of the publisher, and they made this tiny little studio port the game over, so they set them up kind of to fail. And then all the hard work that went into the game, one whole platform doesn't even get to appreciate it right now because of some bad upper management decisions. And like, I know why they released the game. They released it because they wanted it to come out on the same day as the console versions, which worked great and were our awesome games and everyone's enjoying them. So I understand why like they didn't want to wait on it, but I think in, in hindsight, yeah, that probably would have been the right decision if they could take the monetary hit. Now, I know like the reality of game design is sometimes you got to ship the game because you need to get a paycheck. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like this is a business and it's stupid to treat it as anything other than that. Like it's a business. And then if you're really, really lucky, you get to also make some great art with it. But if you can't pay your bills, you're not going to be in business very long. And I, so I understand that, but it's Warner brothers. I feel like they probably could have <laughs> held it a longer if they wanted to, like they're, they're a big enough company that I, I don't know their financials. So I don't want to assume too much, but I think they probably could have held it longer if they knew it was going to be this big of a deal. Well, the game had already gotten delayed a couple of times. Though. It had. And I'm sure they were like, no, like, forget it. It just, it has to come out now, <laughs> push it out, which I understand that decision. They probably didn't know it was going to run I this bad. Well, I said I understand the I don't, decision. I don't, I, don't, be, I don't because they knew it was bad already. They did. I don't agree with it, but like I understand them going, all right, whatever. It's the PC version. Let's just push it out with everything else and move on. I mean, I, it's not. It's good, weird because but. it's like I mean, people. Who, I mean, obviously, I'm interested in you. You're developing this game on PC and stuff. Sure. Is it pretty nuts to actually develop for PC stuff, knowing that everyone has so many freaking ridiculous specs like this guy's this one video card this has a cpu is it kind of complicated or is, is it it's got to be a challenge i think well so yeah i mean like the biggest problem is like issues that you can't reproduce right um like and because we don't have like a giant qa department we have <laughs> yeah. like the three people we have on full-time staff right now <laughs> you know like um and so then the three of us have to like sit down and play the game all the way through to try to see where there's issues um i I feel like there is, some of this stuff is a technology pipeline problem, and some of it is um, an expectations problem. Like, um, there's there's a uh, like there's a rough kind of estimation that budgets for games have doubled every console generation. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, I think from like PlayStation One to PlayStation Two to PlayStation Three, and then probably into PlayStation Four, it's kind of continued on. Um, like. And the same thing kind of applies to PC. Obviously, PC is not on that same kind of generational split. Um, but the expectation of what the quality of the game is obviously gets bigger and bigger. Um, and I think that um, this current 
console generation has introduced a weird problem where suddenly the AAA studios and publishers can't meet the demand or the expectation of the game and the quality that's supposed to go into it. Mm-hmm. Um, we saw that with Assassin's Creed Unity. Obviously, that one was really bad, and it was all bad on all platforms. And then yeah. uh, Batman was bad on uh, PC, so bad that it is permanently tarnishing their reputation. And it's like, yeah. um, and I think that like the problem is that the game industry doesn't actually change until things are wrong. Like, and I think that they're finally realizing now that their expectation of like, oh, just set a deadline and tell the developer to meet it, and then if they don't meet it, just fire the developer, is like not solving a structural problem. Like, <laughs> like yeah. SimCity was bad because they were told to set up all this DRM stuff and all this server stuff that they weren't necessarily really super equipped to do. I mean, like, Maxis was not necessarily known for making massively multiplayer online games. <laughs> um, and then, like, they, they destroyed Maxis as a result of that. They, like, mm-hmm. shut down the whole history of that studio because they were like, as a publisher, well, you were supposed to do this, and you failed at it. But the reality is that the publisher was saying, you were supposed to do something that is just unreasonable to try to expect the developer to actually accomplish. And then to then turn around and say, okay, well, this is just going to keep going this way, I think we're finally seeing some things like the Steam refund policy is probably the best thing that ever happened to fix. I, I was I was going to ask you, as a smaller developer, does that yeah. worry you, or does that make you happy that bigger games are going to be held more accountable for when they totally screw over their players? So I've had um, conflicting emotions about this because, like, we I, I went through like the the what the five stages of grief or whatever <laughs> it was when I heard about the uh, <laughs> the Steam thing, and at first I was sort of like, no, nah, I'm not worried about that, and then I was like, oh wait. Our game is less than two hours long. It's kind of like a gone home style length. Like, oh my god, are people going to play it? And they're just going to return it, and then they're just like not going to. We're not going to make any money. And it's like, um, so far, uh, we haven't really gotten that many returns. I mean, some people have returned it where they're like, "Game not good," or like, "You just walk <laughs> around," or like some, or a couple of people said, um, "Doesn't run on my machine," or. Somebody was like, I liked the trailer better or whatever, you know, and, like, <laughs> and I, I kind of understand, um, I, under, I understand that that stuff just happened. Welcome to the internet. Like, <laughs> right? But like of the, of the refunds, I mean, it's like, it's like less than 4% or something like that. And that's not a very big number. I know some people have been reporting higher numbers than that. And we're an early access game, right? And I expect right. us to get some returns that way. Um, but I think that honestly, giving consumers the ability to do something about a poor purchase is the about the only way that we've been able to resolve this kind of problem. And and I, I think gamers deserve some criticism for this because gamers need to stop pre-ordering games. Like, yes. Um. Like, and for whatever reason, they just refuse to. Right. Like, it's like because oh no. Tristan, how else are you going to get the extra Batman outfit, Tristan? They're not just going <laughs> to give it to you, okay? Except when they release it as a DLC, like a month. Well, later. you have a decent point, but I don't remember that happening. <laughs> uh, um, I, I think it's very interesting. I think it's. I don't think it's a coincidence that Steam refunds came out right before Arkham Knight released, and then Arkham Knight was pulled off sh- digital shelves because it ran so poorly. Like. That can't be a coincidence. No, I, I would yeah, love. It's a coincidence. Um, you, you think it is? Well, okay. So I think actually uh, the Steam refund policy is because Steam is branching out into hardware sales, and they need to uh, comply with EU standards for purchases and returns. Right. Um. So like. No, I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that Batman was pulled off the oh, shelves. No, no, like, oh, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm yeah, sorry. I yeah. I, if, I was thinking you were trying to take it the other way that like the no, refund no, no. policy was announced. For, but no, 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 no. no, 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 no totally. The other way. That's the only reason it was removed from the shelves. Like, yeah. That, yeah. You're, you're totally correct. I, I really wish, like, it'll probably be years before we see any refund numbers on games, if at all. <laughs> but I've got to assume, like, the numbers for that game, it must have been ridiculous. Yeah. Like, and, and hopefully, like, and the thing is, you know, with game development, just like movie development or anything that takes a couple of years to make, you're not going to see things change immediately, necessarily. But I bet games that are midway through development, they're in the early stages, maybe pre-production, I bet a lot of people are looking at Batman right now and going, okay, whatever happens, we can't do that. Like with this refund thing, with the with the way gamers are currently looking at games, like whatever we do, we need to not have that happen to us when we come out. And hopefully that will be 
that will create some positive change. I personally would be fine if most developers dialed back the graphics some, like dial back the incredible complexity of some of the the game development to just make the game work okay and be functional on as many systems as possible. Like I'd be totally fine with that. Graphics have been great for years. Like I don't need to see major graphical improvements every single year. They do continuously get better, but like I would be okay if that just stagnated for a little while because stuff looks so good. And that let developers like catch up and breathe a little and work on other stuff because it feels like there's still this stupid graphical arms race, which we're seeing a lot of backlash on the Xbox One and the PS4. Lots of people are upset because the leap from the PS3 to the PS4 is nothing like the PS1 to the PS2 or the PS2 to the PS3. It's not as big of a difference. And already these consoles are having trouble playing some newer games, lots of newer games, um, because they're not that powerful. Because to keep the thing price competitive, like you just can't charge what you want to be able to charge and you can't charge that much. So you can't put as nice of a parts in it. And like, it, that's just, that's where the market's at for consoles. So I'd be fine if they just back it down a little bit. Like the games will still be great. Make the game play good, make the game fun, back the graphics down a little bit, back, you know, back the length down a little bit if you need to. And make shorter, don't, don't be Batman. Games. Yeah. And don't be Batman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, just don't be Batman. And uh, now my news item. Uh, Battlefront is going to have split screen on the Xbox One and the PS4. Curiously, it's not going to have split screen on the PC. And I say that's curious, not because like, but the people on the PC really want it. Most people on the PC are probably not going to play Battlefront split screen. I don't know how many people are going to do it on the PS2. I certain or PS3, PS4, and Xbox oh, One. Oh man, you you went way back in time. I, I was thinking PS2 because I used to play <laughs> split screen. Six hundred. I, I played split screen <laughs> Battlefront quite a lot on the PS2. That's why I was gotcha, thinking of that. Gotcha. So like. On a couch, I definitely see the use for it, but like I could just as easily do it on my PC. So it seems odd they're just emitting the feature. I wouldn't be surprised if we if that changes during development. Um, do you I wouldn't think anything that has to do with the graphical bump. But see, that's the thing. I mean, it's like that, that wouldn't make sense on the PC. Like if the console can run it split it, it, screen. It, honestly, it, it mostly I think has to do with um, multiple sign-ins and things like that. That like, could be true. Yeah. Like, you know, like on a PS4 or Xbox One, it's pretty easy to just tap a button and it's like sign a different username in. The way it like oh, works with if you have point. it Steam or Origin, they don't really have an easy way to do that. Yeah, but if you were just split I was screen on the that same Borderlands account. 2 didn't have that on, on PC because I got it and I was going to play with Joy because I saw a cope. I already had it. It was like a deal. I got it. And then we ended up getting it on whatever console at the time. Hmm. But, but did, when, you, when you do it on a console now, do you have to have two live accounts? No. Okay, hmm. I mean, so uh, on the on the on the PlayStation, as long as somebody has PlayStation or like PSN right. servers, yeah. So she just signs so that, in, that, and that then yeah. that, that, I don't think that should. So be a it, fact it could work the same way as what James is saying. Like, there's no reason it has to be different than. But I mean, she I has no. Think, she has to sign into a username, her username. Like she had, like she right, created it, a. Account. It could be done the same way on like you had to sign in the, for the first time with that username, and it took a long time. Like, there's no reason you can't set that up on the PC. But so, so one thing for reference, just as far yeah. as like, and not that. Um, not that this is necessarily like a giant hurdle, but um, whenever you're going between any of those platforms, you tend to be dealing with a specific API that has to go through whichever platform you're using. So like you can't really use any of the functionality of any PlayStation network stuff with anything that goes with Xbox, even if they're doing the exact same thing. And you can't really take that stuff to PC, even if they're doing the exact same thing, because they're like, you need to use the fun- function calls that access our servers through our API, doing everything the way that this is set up to do, and then we actually run it through certification to make sure that you did it exactly the way that we told you to do it, or it won't work. Mm -hmm. Um, And so like a lot of times, um, the reason that those things seem like they should be in all the versions but aren't, is that essentially they have to reconstruct it from scratch for each one, and they have Hmm. to figure out how much money they have to spend to make this particular piece of the game viable. And the bigger the game is, the more money actually goes into getting that compatible. That makes sense. Um, yeah, so, and, and it seems weird and unintuitive, but like until we actually have some sort of unified API for all platforms, then that's going to keep kind of being a little bit of a pain in the ass. That makes sense, yeah. I also, I also heard that Microsoft charges per pixel. Which is why they have less <laughs> pixels in their games than others. Yeah, they, they, they try to save some money that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, all right, James, what's, uh, what's your So item? I am a big science nerd, and I love space and stuff like that. Um, Pluto? And, yep, Pluto. <laughs> but to tie it into games, <laughs> the, uh, the, the processor that's in the, uh, the, what's it called, the New Horizons? 
I read about this today. It's, it's the same as the the PS One processor. Like it's it's big, it's so you could say it, a it's PlayStation the, it's One the same. is it's driving MIPS R three thousand processor. How fast is it? Do you have any specs on it? You want to guess? Uh, I'm going to guess it's a, a two eighty six. 60 megahertz, 66 Anybody megahertz. That's my guess. 120 megahertz. I, I, guess? I, can't, I can't guess. Joel, Joe, yeah, you're I, yeah, I, I was going to say probably like 120. 12. <laughs> 12 that, megahertz. The PlayStation was 12 megahertz? <laughs> it's wow. a 32 bit processor that clocks in at 12 that's megahertz. Insane. Wait, that was even slow for when the PlayStation came out then. <laughs> yeah. Huh. So. Cool. Dang. Anyway. I, I, I read that the only difference on that, though, is they made it like. Able to withstand radiation. Body or armor. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's like actually a PS One. Like in there, the disc still spinning. Like, come on. That's why they didn't go with an N sixty four. They didn't have to like have a robot blow the cartridge out like a hundred miles <laughs> in between Earth and Pluto. They have to bring. They have to bring like shirts too. So they can put the shirt. <laughs> uh, no, they should have made it an NES. It'll never break. That probe will work until it reaches the edge of the Milky Way. <laughs> it's it's great. It's crazy that twelve megahertz is piloting this thing like 3 billion miles. I mean, yeah. can't wait to see where, you know, space exploration goes in the future. With Th- throw a court to do on that now. <laughs> do you uh, put Dave's processor in there? What do you have, Dave? Uh, actually, I've got that same CPU right now, the, the 12 megahertz <laughs> one. Can, you can't run a watch off that now. <laughs> no, you don't understand, James. It's 3DS Max, it loves those, all 12 of those megahertz. <laughs> <laughs> it loves it. <laughs> Um, and then Dave, what's your item? Uh, surprise, surprise. My news item this week is Witcher related, specifically Gwent, the in-game card game. Uh, Joel, I don't think you saw this story yet. Gwent almost didn't make it into the game. Like it was, uh, no. it was a, si- it was a side project and, um, the game is hugely popular. People are like making money selling fake card decks. Well, I guess not fake, like reproductions on eBay that both Joel They're and I have quality reproductions. Actually, some, some of them are pretty nice. Uh, some people on Etsy are making some good money off of those. Um, the Witcher 3 is a ridiculously huge game, but the fact that there's a actually very carefully balanced, very fun and in-depth card game, it's just like a little side thing. Well, not, not a little side thing in this huge open world game is, is really impressive. But the development of The Witcher 3 was about halfway through, and they were looking at doing the last few side items, like the horse racing, uh, the boxing, and stuff like that. And they were going to just put the dice poker from Witcher 1 and 2 in. And two of the developers who are big into card games said, hold on, card games were big in medieval periods. Let's try to come up with one that's like fits into our world. And uh, the lead developer on The Witcher 3 said, this is insane and crazy. The game's halfway done. We don't have time to make a whole card game to go into the world and make side quests for it, all this stuff. So these two guys went home over the weekend and just brainstormed. And the one guy basically came up with the entire concept of the game while taking a long bath that weekend. And the next day, he made 100 cards by hand. Like, called his friend up. He they made 100 cards. I can't make 100 anything by hand. <laughs> I I'm like, holy cow! <laughs> How I'm imagining it, James, like hundred like, sandwiches or something. You might like hundred logs. <laughs> <I'm> sorry, <laughs> so crass. This is how I imagine it too. Is like like Saturday is like the bath, just like twelve hours bath brainstorming. Sunday is just like furious photoshopping. They came in that Monday with a hundred cards and played a, a real world demo of the game. And with just one demo, the lead on the, on Witcher three said, this is fantastic. This fits the world. It's fun. Make it work. And they added it to the game. And he says uh, here in the article that the amount of positive feedback on the card game is insane. And they're not committing to doing any kind of standalone version yet, just because they were not planning for anything like that. But they're saying, keep telling us you want that because we're already talking about how we could do it. And the last note that I wanted to point out was he talks about how they would have to balance it for player versus player because the idea of the card game in The Witcher 3 is Mm. eventually you become unstoppable. Like you get all the nice, unique cards because you're supposed to feel more powerful as you beat more people. It's like an RPG card game where like, yeah, I mean, as it plays the game, you level up, you get better cards, then you can go back to play the easier level characters and just destroy them. I mean, but isn't that (laughs) kind of just Magic the Gathering anyway? Like if you got more money, you play Magic the Gathering and you always beat everybody else. (laughs) Uh, that's my understanding based on the people I know who play it. Yeah. Unofficially. It kind of is a little pain to win. I, I, Joel, I feel like you and I need to do a video about this because we thought the same thing. Like, okay, this is not balanced for player versus player. Uh, but we, we have a Gwent cast. 
Mm. <laughs> then we set some base rules for when we played in real life. And what we found is, um, I think I've won four games or three games and Joel, you've won two. It, we have just a, a set rule of which cards you can put in your deck. It still has that bit of randomness. It has some of the strategy and the bluffing like you have in poker. It's a lot of fun and it's pretty balanced already. So I, I think they could definitely do a standalone version and please, please do. I would pay money for this. Put it on the Android marketplace. Go to the <laughs> oh, Play Store. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, honestly, I want, an, I want an iPhone version of it. Like, I want an app game. That would be you so guys, much You guys got Fallout quality. Shelter. Stop being greedy, Joel. Ooh. <laughs> We're, it's I coming for us. It's it. coming. Because right. I'm a console gamer. I want it all, and I want it now. <laughs> oh, oh, you mean you only want like the 150 games you got in your generation? That's what you mean. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Um, it is now mail- exclusives. Yes, because the PC doesn't <laughs> have let's any go of there. those. Let's go there this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not, Joel. How about how about I, we share? I'll just I was just begging you. Uh, yeah, that's not. Thank you, Neon. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> <laughs> more that, Please, come on. <laughs> a little more of that premature articulation. <laughs> um, it is now mail time. <laughs> mail time. You can write into the show at casual shenanigans at gmail.com. Just like Connor did. Connor wrote in, warning, mandatory cheesy email introduction imminent. Hey, guys, love the podcast. I have created and found several images I thought would amuse you, so I'm sending them to you. One is a picture of a potato masher I thought you guys would appreciate, and the rest are screenshots from this game that he thought we would find amusing from Play Evolved. Um, the, the pictures he sent me are a potato with a bunch of parts sticking out of it, and it was tweeted out by Electronic Arts, and it says, and here's a never-before-seen picture of our servers, and it's literally a potato with a heat sink, a RAM stick, <laughs> a VGA cord, and a USB cable poked into it. Um, and then he sent me some screenshots from Plague Evolved, where apparently he put our names into it. So it says like victory germ gaming has successfully eliminated all life on earth (laughs) or maybe a virus or something. Thanks. I think. Um, And then he said, in addition, if you Jeremiah, I presume it's Jeremiah who reads all the emails. If you and Dave decide to do an offshoot podcast, just about guns, I thought you might consider naming it casual shenanigans. guns. (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's awful. <laughs> oh, the cheese. That's uh, not within our branding standards. <laughs> thank he you, was thank actually you. probably being really serious, so he's like, oh, man. No, thank you, Connor. Crying right now. The pictures made me smile. <laughs> Papa you, James Connor. lays down the law on the branding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, Mikey wrote in. He has, a, he has a tech question. He says, hey, I'm building Hey, a Mikey. Game. Yeah, his name's Mikey. Yeah, yeah. That's an hey, angel. That, that's like a normal name. <laughs> was, hey, anyway. Mikey. All right. Hello. He's building a gaming <laughs> PC with a budget of a little over $600. He just has a quick question. Uh, would an FX6300 and an R9 270X be better than an FX4350 and an R9 280? Basically, would a cheap hexacore and a uh, cheaper graphics card be better than a cheap quad core and a nicer graphics card? And since no one else here knows anything about AMD, well, I don't know if Tristan does, but the rest of these three losers are all team Intel and NVIDIA. Um, I would say that in most cases, the quad core is going to be totally fine for most gaming and productivity, and it'll certainly be nicer to have the better graphics card. If you're playing something that's heavily multi-threaded, though, definitely get the hexacore because the R9270X is still a great graphics card if you're playing it uh, 1080p. Totally fine. Um, so... You could really go with either. It just depends on what productivity you do. Like if you're playing Arma, having six cores won't help you. Uh, if you're doing a lot of video editing, having six cores will make a difference. So, uh, And we will answer your question in depth more on Casual Shanigan's Tech next episode. Uh, now, it's time for 90 Seconds with Joel, part of the podcast, where Joel talks about whatever he wants for, well, normally about five minutes. So, Joel, <laughs> what do you got for us? Um, okay, I, rec- I was going to talk about Apple. But um, I, I realized since we have Tristan Moore on here, and he is a developer, and he's worked on lots of PC stuff, and the game is going to be ported to consoles, right? Or at least PS4, at least I heard? One game yeah, is PS4. So we're, we're bringing, One game, we're both bringing Grave and Reflections are both coming to play. Oh, Reflections too? Awesome. Yeah, yeah. We got approved. It's good. <laughs> Sweet. Nice. Sweet. Okay, I, I am very curious about something, and this is what I've always thought this is what it's like, but I'd be curious to know from your perspective since you actually are doing this. Okay, let's let's say you have console, PS4, and you have a PC. They have the exact same specs. Let's just say that's actually possible. They have the exact same specs, right? Because I know they, they make specific ones for consoles and all that stuff, so you can't really 100% get the exact one, right? When you're developing for 
the console and for PC. What is the percentage like? I, I to me, I feel like the console would have a slight edge over the PC with the exact same specs, just because PC development is sometimes is harder to get as polished as the console. Sometimes because it has a dedicated like this is the specs, so they can spend more time knowing every system is the same, and you can maybe push a little bit more out of it. Um, what would you say is like if you know if the PS4 has four gigs of RAM or whatever, eight gigs of RAM, the PC has eight gigs of RAM. I feel like you need to have a little bit more overhead on the PC if it's about the same specs. Like, I just feel like that in general for playing PC games, you need to have a little bit more overhead than the, than the PS4 for most stuff because of sometimes development issues. Well, and I mean, I, I think that uh, the, uh, the it, most of what you said is pretty accurate. I mean, um, the main thing that consoles have as an advantage is that you can figure out exactly what that system caters to, right? So, like, when you set up threading for, like, how you set up multi threading processes or something like you can actually say okay we know this is what we're working with it doesn't have to scale to other machines it just does this um you can like set your physics on one thread and you can set graphics um rendering split between a few threads and like kind of control that more specifically um and that tends to produce a better result but i think that aside from that it's one of those weird things of like um you can't actually build an exact um, configuration for every PC game um, to run on every machine. Like one one example is like in theory, if um, you have control over all of the graphical options in the game, you could probably get it to run at exactly the same performance by tuning it yourself in the console or something like that. Like I I remember when I was playing um, Half Life Two, like they have all their graphics configurations options. But yeah. then they also have, like, you can open up the command console dialogue and you can actually manually change every single tiny detail of that. Mm -hmm. And you can actually, if for your machine, set it up so that it runs way more performance optimized and still looks the same, right? Whereas, like, um, you could then play Tomb Raider and you could turn on the hair simulation stuff that they have in that game and then it would just kill it completely on any machine right mm -hmm. um and so like and that's a big big picture example of like obviously you can't have hair simulation on consoles but there are like thousands of tiny little details that also work that way of like how fast objects change to lower details at distances and how it mip maps textures so like reduces the the quality down at a range and um Really, it's like if you could control every single one of those things, you would probably get the same performance on an equivalent PC. And mm -hmm. we do kind of use that as a benchmark. Um, like I know roughly where my PC, my work machine, lines up to PS3 and Xbox One. But you also have to keep in mind that whatever it says on the box, um, there's a usable amount of RAM and graphics memory on a console that is actually much lower than it's, what they is it like something advertise. like five and a half gigs on the PS4? Is that correct? I've heard that. So PS4, it's actually four, and um, I think it, it's four point five, and it's like five <laughs> on that face, Xbox Jeremiah. One. Um, <laughs> and so, like, um, yeah, no, and, and as a as a PC gamer with like twenty four gigs of RAM <laughs> and about to upgrade to like thirty two or something, I, I think I'm. I find that a, a really funny, but. Um, but yeah, and actually the main difference between PlayStation 4 and um, Xbox One is that PlayStation 4 uses GDDR5 mm -hmm. um, RAM instead of uh, DDR3. And so it's a little more in line and parallel, but... Uh, hey, but the Xbox has the online cloud that's going to do all the processing. <laughs> it's the future. Well, I, I mean, in theory, PlayStation 4 could do that too. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's just not something that they have necessarily worked out all the kinks for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. PS4 couldn't do it because they can't keep their network up. Long enough to <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Sorry, it's been a bad week. <laughs> I don't know if that really answered or helped clarify anything, but no, I think hopefully. it does. No, no yeah, the, the, okay, then I, I was kind of correct the way I thought. Yeah, that makes sense. No, yeah, no Joel, cool. I, I'm going to give you an extension on on your 90 seconds this week because I want to hear what you were upset about Apple for. Like, I, I don't okay. want to miss out on you actually <laughs> having a bone to pick with Apple about something. So go ahead. Oh, you're gonna, I'm going to be pissed. Oh, gosh. Okay, so... Um, gosh. I'm just... I'm, I'm really, really honestly pissed about this. Okay, so I own, I own a lot of music on iTunes. Um, just throughout the years, right? Um, I don't buy a lot of albums that much anymore. Just because I just don't 
want to own a lot of albums, but every once in a while I own very specific specific stuff, kind of like the Bonobo, Bonobo stuff I like, I buy. And I usually get them actually through like codes from when I buy the LPs for some of them that I really want to have as just kind of collectors. But with the newest music, they change so many freaking things. Like radio, I, okay, I, I, I like the accessibility of like, I made a couple stations. I have the Ink Spots radio, I have a Bonobo station, I have like kind of like a, a like, I don't know, a couple different stations, right? So I jump in the car, I can press the, the button to go on the iPad or iPod area and radio is right there and it's like four little cubes. I tap it, bam, I'm already playing that radio. Like, and it's a big button, so it's nice because when you're in the car, instead of fumbling around, like it's a tiny little button, you gotta switch. It was nice, it was nice and big and you could just easily tap Whoa. it, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, it's like, okay, let's say you're at you're, you're at the, a traffic light and you want to quickly change the station. Well, if it's a tiny little thing you got to scroll through, I, I, I just don't deal with that stuff. Like, But if it's big, I can just quickly tap the button. So I, I really I, liked it. I have an Android. I can pretty much make it any size I want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you, James? <laughs> okay, anyways, but but the, but here's the worst, right? Now, now with... With Apple Music, um, I, not even not even their like little store, the the thing you can buy that's like RDO and Spotify, it's it's a freaking huge ad like on the iPod like iPod area. You're just like, oh, I want to get to music. That's the first thing you see is like buy this, buy this. I'm like, what the crap? When did this turn into like EA like DLC type stuff ads everywhere? And then okay, I only want to have like 15 albums downloaded from iTunes because I don't want to see all my entire library of stuff that I purchased a long time ago that I'm like embarrassed to listen to anymore. Like I don't, I'm not into that music anymore, right? Um, but no, you can't, you can't do that anymore now. And at least I haven't found it, I haven't figured it out. And usually Apple's really easy to figure out like, you know, how to change stuff, you know, because it's fairly simple. Yeah, because they no, only you give can't. you like five different options to change. They're all right which, here. Which is great, which is great. <laughs> Because you're totally modding your Android phone, aren't you? You're modding no. the crap out of it, right? Nope. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I didn't think you were. So, anyways. <laughs> um, no, but I'm annoyed because it's it's be like, it's, it's like let's say you have 50,000 records and you have tons of them, right? It's like, oh, man, you know, I just want to have 20 of them maybe upstairs, like, by my, my wine cabinet. And I just want to pick out between the 20 I really want to listen to this year. <laughs> nope, you have to have all 50,000 of them in your living room. Like, I don't want to sort through all this crap. <laughs> oh, it just pisses me off because I'm like, and it made me think about this. Like, think about this, guys. You own devices nowadays that nothing physically changes about it, but all of a sudden the entire experience is completely different. So music I owned for years, I'm not going to be using as much on my phone because of a simple operating change. And mm -hmm. it's just weird to think. So like my record player is not going to get an OS update and be like, oh man, I can't play my records, <laughs> you know? But like with games and stuff, it's weird how you can buy a game or play something for a long period of time. Then they do an update. It's like, oh, well, can't play anymore because it, you have to be connected to Xbox Live or you have to be connected to this. It's just a weird world we're living in. Like if your house <laughs> mandated a pipe change in your bathroom so that you had to yeah. like flush differently. <laughs> you have to stand up when like, yeah. all the time. I, 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 I do love change. I understand that, you know, to try something different, you got to, you know, you, you, you have to change. Yeah, it. But, if it, but if it's not broke. Oh, but I mean, but the thing is, I mean, graphics cards aren't broke. They work really well. We barely even get any use out of graphics cards now, and they're already chucking out five more of them the same month. It's like, dude, well, we haven't even barely begun to like peak the performance of this graphics card, but we're already at like 18 new cards out. But I don't know. It's just frustrating me because I'm like, dang it. Like I, I'm, I can't really experience this, my, my music anymore the same way because I don't want to <laughs> scroll through a gigantic list of music to Can find it. Can you not it. set like, up favorites? Like you, now, James, see, you, you, see, you can James, do some of that. What I sorry, do on sorry, my sorry. phone is I just hooked my phone up to the computer and I just dragged over the folders I wanted and then I just opened it up, the music app, and it, like they're already there. And then it automatically found the ones on my SD card, so I could just drop stuff on there if I wanted. And like <laughs> it's just there. If you want to crazy, and the exact organizational crazy, structure is set up. Yeah, or, yeah, I can have a widget set up where I can just <laughs> I mean, you know, flip through. Yeah, them. I mean, and you used to get you used to do that. I, I would just plug it in my iPod, you know, click download or whatever. But now you see everything cloud based, and it's really hard to distinguish between what you have actually downloaded on the iPhone and what is in the cloud, like what I don't have downloaded. So I'm like. And if you don't have unlimited data or whatever, I'm like, could you, I, I, it, it's got to suck for anyone with that because it's like you cook on the wrong one, you just streamed an entire album. I'm like, oh crap, I don't have data. Like, it, it's does it's, your iPhone I, I, not let you limit what uh, what it can use data for? Can you not just like toggle? Don't let don't let this app use data. 
I think you. I mean, I, you, okay. no, you can. You I'm should just, be able I'm, to because I think I did on my yeah, yeah. when I had one. No, I know, but I'm just saying it's it's a big change from just it being is. able to go. Oh, it just it worked like that. It I don't know. It's just weird. I, I and I hate that music is turning into this gigantic social thing of like, oh, here's a song and then share it over here and you got to talk about it on this like just in the iPod app. Like I want to get my <laughs> old iPod Mini back from like 2005. It worked great and I loved it. Yeah. F you, Apple. <laughs> <laughs> I gave my iPod Classic to my mom. It's still kicking. It's a, like an, one of the eight, 80 gig iPod videos. And like it's, you know, eight years old now. Works No, nine years old now. It still works great. Like it, it's it's so simple. You scroll. You <laughs> yeah, select mine the, too. Yeah, you Although, select the song and play the song. Like it's the best music player ever. <laughs> Speaking of my 80 gig iPod though, uh, Joel, can you look in the back pocket of your driver's side seat? I'm going to left it there. <laughs> okay. I can't find it this week. It's it's missing. I'm, I'm going to be sad if my nine-year-old iPod is just gone. <laughs> okay, I'll take a look. All right, uh, you guys coordinate that after the podcast, maybe. Um, <laughs> it was related. <laughs> I, I hope I hope the next iOS or whatever just re- changes because I remember uh, iTunes even like five years ago they did a really crazy change and it was like awful and they changed it back really quick. So I'm I'm hoping for that. So mm-hmm. iTunes is bad in the world just like as it yeah. is without yeah. changing it. I I don't think the actual <laughs> iTunes app on my Mac is. I think it's fine. I, I like it. I don't mind it. <sighs> What does it not have enough visualizers for you, James? <laughs> no, it's, it's really <laughs> visualizers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna just go ahead and put a stop to that. Um, <laughs> as we wrap the podcast down tonight, Tristan, where yeah. should people go? Should they go to just uh, brokenwindowstudios.com? Is that the best place to find you? Should they follow you on Twitter? Like, if, if we're gonna direct people to check out your yeah. stuff, what's the best way? Well, I'm always on Twitter um, at Tristan Parish. Um, we also have the game at play reflections and at grave game okay um and then uh we, we yeah you can go to brokenwindowstudios.com um we're on steam so um we now have our game up on steam officially in early access so people can check that out there for reflections um and play it today <laughs> and um i, I mean I, I could probably list like five billion other things we've got like we're on indie tv we've got a facebook we've got, well here but, i mean p- put any of that in an email and send it to me sure. and I'll, I'll put it in the link so if you guys are like, I don't want to have to look for all that. Look in the description of the podcast. <laughs> Links to all Tristan's stuff will be in there. Sure. Um, and expect your sales to skyrocket after this podcast. <laughs> <Cool. laughs> that it, sounds fantastic. They, they call it the filthy casual effect. They don't. No one does that. Um, uh, I was going to ask you, Free your game is in early access. Is it, is it cleared to be like streamed and recorded and stuff? Is that... Yeah, is no, we actually, we like have an axe that we chase people down with. If anyone okay, makes cool. any All right, No, I'm kidding, actually. No, yeah, yeah, everyone, we actually, we've been really excited because tons of people have done videos and gameplay streams and stuff. And it's like, it's part of our dev process, really, because we get to see people playing it and then respond to it. And the only thing that we ha- hope is that they have the main menu screen at the beginning so we know which version number they were on <laughs> so that we don't <laughs> have the wrong impression if like there was a bug or something but yeah no that, that's that's great we're totally happy to have that sweet yeah I wanted to make a video of it but I think I need to play reflections more so the video isn't 30 minutes of me going wait no I put the thing oh, I forgot what I'm doing like I'm, I'm so bad at puzzle <laughs> games it would be really bad for everyone to watch like most puzzle games is me walking around just hitting stuff going do you do stuff do you do stuff <laughs> that's fun too <laughs> well actually what's kind of funny is like um and I know you guys gotta wrap this up but that's oh, right um reflections doesn't have any like specific goals in the way I know it's games killing do. me <laughs> Hey, do, would you like um, me to review it? <laughs> no, would I don't you know, like, maybe of, you like you me or Dave to review it? Um, yeah, maybe yeah. That's, I, mean, I, I think know think James is a big the, Gone Home fan. Yeah. We're probably the, be- the best to review it. <laughs> my, my Let's Play would be like 11 hours long somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and so, well, so and it's actually, it's on a kind of like Majora's Mask style time schedule so that you can't, um, you can't just wait until something happens because you might miss it in some cases. And it's like, um, we, we did that as a way of kind of making the choice system more relevant because um, you really don't have to do anything. You can actually experience the game, sit and watch, and the game would still technically do something. You just wouldn't have a very satisfying game experience. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, I think that we, we think it's really important and cool to, like, make it so that it's a different strokes for different folks kind of game so that, like... Hopefully, if you just explore, uh, Jeremiah, the stuff that you uh, want to do, you can mm-hmm. still do something interesting. I have put some darts and records into a box. I'll have you okay. know. And I've cool. turned on numerous light switches. <laughs> that, There's also a record player. I did find the music. record player, but I had spare records, so I put them in the box. 
<laughs> I don't know if that's going to be relevant later, but the record thing was cool. So I thought maybe there's a record player wherever this box is going. Cause I feel it like it actually probably will be relevant later. I mean, I say probably as if I somehow don't know the answer to that, but yeah. Um, <laughs> I uh, might add it later. <laughs> <laughs> that's the other thing too, is like in early access, I could be like, let me make a note of that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, actually, a lot of that stuff will be relevant, like what you pack in the make box. Make games easier for people like Jeremiah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, so I, I'll just tell you, there's actually a little, like, Easter egg where if you type in God mode on the phone, it tells you you now can't die, uh, which is what we thought was funny because it's a Gone Home style <laughs> game where you, there's no way to die, so... Um, <laughs> so we just made it that it's like, now you can't take damage because you're in God mode, so... Yeah, anyway. Um, cool. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you for coming on the shelf or coming on the the podcast, man. It's yeah, really it's awesome. actually always fun. I should actually just beg you guys more so I can do come it. on more often. Well, that's how we yeah, do this it. Is, now, this now is that you've been on the show, for sure. Now that you've been on the show, you have a standing invitation. We do this for all our guests. You have a standing invitation to come back on anytime you've got something new and cool you want to talk about. I'll just be like, hey, I just wanted to rant know. about like graphics resolution stuff. And just Please like, do. <laughs> you fit in well. <laughs> yeah, cool. you fit in well with this group. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming on. Uh, everyone, sure. again, go go check Tristan out in the description of this video and the audio version if you're listening to that. Um, you can follow us mm-hmm. online, casual, www.casualshenanigans.com. Right into the show, casualshenanigans at gmail.com. You can tweet at casualshenaniga, at germgaming, at evilviking. And you can find me and Dave on YouTube, germgaming and evilviking13. Um, next week... We'll, we'll be back to our normal uh, schedule. I don't think we have a specific topic picked out for next week yet, but when we do, we let you guys know. And remember, we'll we have lots of cool extra content from this weekend, though. Oh yes, that's true. That's true. We're all we're all going to be sunburned horribly. <laughs> um, and and remember, next Saturday, July twenty fifth, there will be the GTA Online Community Event. So if you've joined the Rockstar Social Club, the Seal Slappers, and you haven't got a chance to play with us yet, uh, go ahead and bookmark that Teamspeak server. Hop in ahead of time and say hi, maybe. And uh, and definitely come say hi to us because we'd love to say hi to you. Subscribe, subscribe, like, <laughs> comment, subscribe, um, hammer <laughs> really the helps, like button, comment really if you didn't like it, uh, slam, <laughs> slam that like button, upvote if you really like it, um, and, and then and beyond that, everyone. Thank yeah, you. Well, just just a reminder for the people that are watching yes. on your channels. Um, if you're watching on oh, Evil Viking yes. 13 or Germ Gaming. Is this the last week? No, they have two weeks. This week and next week. Okay, so after next week, they will not be showing it on the their podcast channels. will not get uploaded to our channels. It will only be uploaded to the main Casual Shenanigans YouTube channel, and we will post it on the playlists on our channels. But you will have to go to that, like you'll have to watch it off of that channel. Um, that's part of our unified branding strategy. <laughs> so be sure to go uh, subscribe to that. And if you don't, I have a special video from Joel coming in the next day or two that will convince you to subscribe. Joel, uh, I giggle. <laughs> But but thank you, everyone, for coming out. And as always, stay casual.